Um, I entitled the, the paper I was uh, delivering to you today, Converging on the Fisheries in the South China Sea, because I think we have no choice. This is something we have to do. Even how hard it's going to be, we have to do it, converge ourselves towards the fisheries. If you look at the um, depth profile, as Dr. Lewis mentioned earlier, to the left, you have Malaysia and Vietnam, and the water is very shallow. To the right, you see how deep it is to get. And in the middle of all of that, it is back to islands. You see depths of about uh, uh, 1,400 meters around those areas. And that's why it's very important. I, I deliberately took out the countries in this at the moment because let's just see the region as a whole. It has 571 species of coral, where compared to the Caribbean, is only 65. 3,365 uh, 3, species of marine fish and the Caribbean only has 411. Species riches, that means the number of species you find in one kilometer stretch is 60 in the low sea and the high sea. So it's not only the shallowness, it's really the quality of the seafood. It's going to be very different if you go down to the South China Sea. Uh, the region is known as the center for the coral triangle. Um, it's the center of the center of marine biodiversity. It, it just means compared to the whole world, more species of anything marine is found in this area. And as you move towards the periphery, the number of species decreases. That pattern is very uh, common for many species. But the ones that I like to work with are fish, coral, and cowries. And you can see just how that pattern is consistent. Why that is the case is really an issue of biogeography and how the earth was paved. But at the moment, this is what we have, and we basically are at the center of what sustains the, the globe. If you talk about that. This is what I do. I look at fish, I look at coral. I've been doing this for like 20 years, but way back in 1998, when the first book came out, South China Sea Third World War. Um, we have made proposals at the MacArthur Foundation, the Kathy MacArthur Foundation. I was under the membership of John McManus then. And we worked on a population interdependencies in the South China Sea project, looking into the genetic makeup of all of these. So that is the reason why somebody like me, who's a molecular geneticist, a fisheries, and a marine biologist, is actually in this discussion. So um, my heart goes out to the small scale fishing. This is the person who lives every day by the time that they spend on the water and able to bring home fish for a living in their family. They're under the influence of the weather. If they don't go out, they don't go to fish. If they don't fish, they don't have food. On the other hand, when we had an uh, UNCLOS in 96, this was the uh, maybe the biggest policy that has affected marine fisheries globally. Um, with this new policy, we now had something called ownership, and the commons was no longer commons. If you look at the production of marine fisheries, China being the yellow um, colored bars over there, way back 96, do you see the sudden rise in the production? There is this very steep increase, but the proportionality in the early 60s, it was 50%, 30% from China, but now it's now 70%. So I look at this and I think if there's anybody who has a stake in the fisheries, it's the people who actually have dependent on it more than anybody else. Every time I make graphs of these things, I have to take China out. Because in some places, the bars just become too small from everybody else. So you no longer <coughs> see any trends. So you make a graph and you say, this includes data except China. So um, looking at the recent state of the fisheries and aquaculture report, this is just for marine fisheries. So I'm, I'm pulling out marine fisheries. Top one is China, next is Indonesia. Looking down up into the top 20, I think this is, we'd see Vietnam, there's Philippines, there's Malaysia, Thailand, Taiwan. So um, the, the region, I think, is already providing more than 70% of the whole marine fish supply of the whole world. The other one that is very high would be Chile and Peru, but you could see how uh, sporadic 
that catch is depending on the anchovy and anchoveta fisheries. So just in terms of fisheries, we cannot underscore the region as well as that China, South China Sea. So it's 3.6 uh, million square kilometers, as was mentioned earlier. It's a third largest, it's a third largest sea globally, next to the Aust Australia, I think, and um, there's two, Mediterranean. There are 2,000 million species of fishery resources. So I'm not really sure if this is just because there's more. I, I think this is because there are more species that people actually eat and prefer. There are 190 million people who live on the coastal areas and depend on fisheries for food and livelihood. And we're talking about 70 million tons of fish, worth about $22 billion. This is just landed within the South China Sea. So I'm, I'm not taking all the countries, I'm just taking South China Sea for that number. So in total, the, there's a larger economic activity supported by these fisheries, and it's about 66.7 billion. And there is an estimated 3.37 trillion in cargo that passes through the sea. So um, it used to be 5 point something, but this is an updated figure. Finally, 1.72 million fishing vessels fly the South China Sea waters, employing more than 5.4 million people. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of vessels. And I think there is very few fish left. If you see these two kinds of boats, you see the ones in the foreground, that's the small scale fisher. Very motorized, going more than 50, not more than 5 kilometers, 15 kilometers from shore. And behind it, you'll see the commercial fisheries. That's, um, that's, those are the fishes that are, uh, sorry, those are the boats that go beyond into the deeper waters. Um, within the region, you'd see the Philippines, Indonesia. We have more of these. Maybe because we have inland waters. But if you look at Malaysia, Vietnam, Thailand, they have more of the commercial fishers, the bigger boats. This is what we see there in Malaysia in Vietnam, in, in Thailand. And you can see the difference in the lifestyle and the house as well. So basically, if you're talking about the fish you see on the upper right-hand side, the groupers, the snappers, these are from coral reef habitats, and they're taken from near shore, like the picture below. Whereas the tunas, the bonitos, the, 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 um, the bigger fish, the pelagic fish, the more expensive ones, they're taken by the commercial boats. So there are basically two kinds of fishers. Interestingly, the region eats more fish than anywhere else around the world. If you look at the percentage of fish consumption among the countries listed from this region, Southeast Asia, it's almost three times that which is eaten by Australia, Brazil, Germany, UK, USA. But we cannot separate those two fishers because this is the reef very close to shore, and to be able to have the fish that you see in your tunas and your bonitos, you have to make sure you have a healthy reef, you have to make sure you have a healthy seagrass bed, and you have to make sure you have healthy mangroves. The reason being, the life cycle of the species moves around these different areas. Sometimes they're born in one, they're raised in another, and they spawn in another. But for the tunas, they are eaten. They eat those species. So, you know, the region does not have all of these uh, habitats. And even if they did, it would not be very healthy in many places. Therefore, it's very difficult if you would like to protect the fisheries of the region and only protect the habitats of one country. Looking, however, at the population sizes, the stakes are pretty high for the top China and Indonesia given their population size, their consumption per person, the inshore coral reefs of the world, and habitats. Malaysia eats the most fish in their diets. And um, all of these, however, it must, is much higher than the global average, which is basically 15 kilograms per person per year. So if we lose our fish, it's, it's something that's going to be very difficult for us because it is traditionally our diet. It's traditionally the way we have been raised. Um, Taiwan and China seem to have lower. The reason being their aquaculture is very advanced. And they have sourcing fish very much from their aquaculture. 
culture as well. So here I'm putting this as marine, not, not fish in total, but marine fish. So that's what it looks like when it gets down from the boat. The difficulty is when you put a, a net down, you cannot choose what fish is going to get into your net. It's not like in the US and UK where they manage by species or they're managed by size because the diversity is simply too high for the species in this region. You can get an octopus there, you can even get a shark. But um, they cannot cut down on, on what you get. So management is basically by closing seasons, fishing bans, marine protected areas, or restricting years to certain areas. Fisheries management in Southeast Asia is largely uh, spatially explicit. You control by site and by not by species. So what is the problem? Over exploitation and over capacity. We have hit the capacity, the maximum sustainable yield for the region way back in the 1970s. And that is why the air was an impetus to build aquaculture, but aquaculture doesn't seem to be taking very well for consumption. Aquaculture is taking very well for production, for sales. You, you raise the fish, but other people will eat it. So you're talking about prawns here, you're talking about groupers. Um, these are the different kinds of vessels. Apparently, they can tell who belongs to what and which country is doing what. And I'm really sad because the Philippine boats are always small, but they go to the same places. <laughs> They go to where the big boats are, but because the Scarborough Shoals is still within the small-scale fisher zone of the Philippines, it's very close to shore. What are the consequences of over-exploitation? This is what we call fishing down the Pudwin. If you take out the biggest groupers, you will not have a sustainable population, and they will not replenish. You now end up with lower quality fish dominating your system. When you take out the lower quality fish, you move down the food web again. And this is one joke we would have around each other. When are we going to stop when we start eating jellyfish? Okay. Or simple, you know, it can be this. That's all we have in the waters. Because fishing down the food web simply means the quality of the fish is going down. This is a reef I was certified in. 1988, I became a diver. I came back to the Philippines after having worked in world fish and taking my degree abroad and all, and this is what I saw. Can you see it's exactly the same place? So um, that was just a result of the introduction of aquaculture of, of, of uh, milkfish. And the reefs in themselves are very much in trouble from habitat destruction because of destructive fishing as well. When you fish and you can't find anything anymore, you use destructive fishing activities. This is the reef before Mischief Reef was built. John made this, made this picture. I told John, what is the reason they would do this, and then he said, you look down, you look at this, you feel it's a goner, and then you just put concrete over it. I guess that was the thinking in many of the, the things that they saw. They jump in, they look at it, they see it, and they you know, relegate it for, 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 for destruction. But that is not true. Corals can recover. Corals can be, can be if they were allowed to, and the fish were allowed to return. Unfortunately, if you look at, sorry for the, for the small fonts, I just wanted to make a point here. If you ask a fisher what kind of fish can go where, you'll have different answers from all those different countries. Some will say we have two fishing zones, some will say about four fishing zones, others will say the small scale fishers only go into here, others will say small scale is this big, others will say bigger than that. So I guess this is one of the reasons there's so much trouble in the Scarborough Shoals. Because the definition of who can go where and what is allowed to operate where is not clear between the people who are out there. Um, China has declared fishing ban over the Scarboroughs on uh, over their their area over there between April 16 and August 1. And when they're not there because the their military or their, sorry their coast guards prevent them from fishing to recover the Philippines and the Vietnam will then enter because this is ours. And then you're gonna have this big problem saying you're not allowed to get in because the Chinese have basically declared it as a no fishing zone for their own people. 
And then their people will see that why are the Filipinos in there and why are the Vietnamese in there and they ram their boats. So it's like, it might be communication, it might be just bullying, it might be all of these things. But I think out at sea is not the time to make an argument. And leaving people behind is also not another way to go around. Because even if I bump my car accidentally in somebody else's car, I won't leave that person on the road if I kind of left them to be almost dead. Anyway, industrial fishing fleets take 10% of the global fisheries employees. You get one job for 100 tons of fish, and only one person gets to benefit of all that. A small-scale fisher is 90% of the global fisheries employees. They have 40 jobs per 100 fish. And these are the number of people that depend on that. So there, there is really a really an imbalance between distribution of wealth there. But when there's no more fish, when the small ones go to where the big ones are, it's even greater injustice. So conflicting policies and fishing zones in closed seasons are really one of the major reasons that we have all this trouble. And this is the giant clam. Aren't they pretty? They're, they're really nice. That's what they kept the fashion out in Taijin areas of those. Uh, it's like the sea ivory that was called. It was a shell of the Shanklan. On the left are the red fiery corals. As people have uh, expendable income and their ability to buy increases, this apparently is some of the, the treasures, seven treasures of Buddha or something like that. And that's why it gets to be very important. So the illegal trade of endangered species is something that's very hard to curb, even if on paper it does says that it should not happen. But um, as long as there are buyers, as long as there are sellers, and as long as there are people making money, and desperate people at that, that can cross boundaries. One of the biggest problems we have is climate change. This is going to change the way fish are distributed and who ends up in whose backyard. I guess this is going to be even greater tension for everybody because they will leave the warmer parts and go to the colder parts. And that means maybe this practice will lose its fish and because it's moving out to somewhere else. Other things we worry about, marine pollution. With all that traffic on the sea, there is greater chances that something will happen and the oil will be all over the place. You've seen that happen a few times towards the, uh, the, the oil routes over here. So this convention, however, gives us the right to actually negotiate because it says where the same stocks of associated species occur within exclusive economic zones of two or more coastal states, this state shall seek either directly or through appropriate sub regional or regional organizations to agree upon the measures necessary. You don't find this for oil and gas explorations. You only see this for fisheries. So if there was one policy that can actually help it's fisheries, but at least unless it's recognized in the same at the same position as, as oil and gas and maybe security, it's gonna be very hard. This is the project that I ran for a while. And what we basically see is that we need a regional fisheries management is needed now. Even it's very difficult, fish stocks are ecologically and biologically processes that support them are transboundary nature. The habitats are crucial for the life cycles and not everybody has all the habitats in good condition. Plus, no single country has the capacity and human financial resources, except China, to monitor, control, and survey areas in fair easy, but I'm talking about the ASEAN region. Indonesia used to be very quiet, but now Indonesia is part of the discussion as well. Uh, Joko Widodo has been putting up his own defenses down south in the Natuna Islands. We have to fix this policy. We have to make it common. We have to agree what is right and what is wrong so that no arguments happen at sea. This is a major thing, fishing bans. Um, I guess people just really, really get angry on this and they will do everything to, to you know, stop that. Uh, if you go through Greg Pauling and John McManus's pages, they were talking about fisheries militia. I think it is true that that happens, but that's where the two areas do concentrate. Endangered species, this is a picture from uh, uh, catching of foxville turtles. There's a lot of them that get into these boats. So 
Just to mention the declaration for a decade of coastal marine environmental protection of the South China Sea, this was sound, signed off by China and ASEAN. This is the recent one, 2017 to 2027, and it does have language, finally, on fisheries cooperation and the agreement to, to follow certain rules. Uh, I, I've seen this COC from the time it started. I was a master's student then as well. But to get this this far, I can be very happy because I was at the uh, ASEAN meeting, the APEC meeting that did this. Hopefully, I know it's not, it's a long shot, but if we, if we capitalize on loss of livelihood, loss of income, loss of nutrition, maybe we have to do something quite far with China on this. So they end my presentation here, thank you. Um, with that, uh, I will open the floor for questions. I have some of my own questions, but 